after holding a coffee cup. <laughs> <laughs> I was able to talk while holding the cup. So this presenter must be very mindful. Um, today we are talking about mindfulness impact on life. I have only got two slides. Okay, can you show the first one? Thank you. Oh, I've got three slides. So. Oh, the next one. The next one. Okay. This is a picture that I've shown, I think, quite a few times in dinner with da uh, lunch with Dharma. Um, this is actually a story about the lineage of Chan, Zen, as the Japanese word is Zen, but the Chinese word is Chan, which is actually equivalent to mindfulness in um, the English context. So um, let me explain this picture. This is the Buddha. And you see that the special thing about him is that he holds a flower in his hand. It's a lotus flower. And then, um, this is actually a very long picture in one of the caves. But there is this disciple here named Mahakasyapa. Dajiasa Zhenzhe, the um, Chinese name, Mahakasyapa. And this story about this <coughs> sutra was that once the Buddha was, um, was talking, was teaching, and then he just stopped. And he picked up a flower and just put it in his hand. All the people around him were puzzled, as in the other disciples, the bodhisattvas, the deities, and all the Sangha members, they were all puzzled. Because if the Buddha was teaching, he was supposed to talk, as in to continue talking. But at this point of time, he just stopped, picked up a flower, and stopped there. So everyone is puzzled. They weren't very mindful. They were aware that he stopped, but they weren't mindful of what happened. So, what happened was that only this disciple called Maha Kasyapa smiled at the Buddha because he understood what the Buddha was trying to show through this gesture. All the others didn't. And this thing became the most important story in the <coughs> Buddhist context, especially in the Chinese context. So, the name of this story was actually called the Flower Sermon because he held the flower. And what he was trying to say was that if you want to learn the Dharma or being mindful, it could be beyond words. Because after holding this flower, he smiled, Mahakasyaka smiled, and the Buddha of course was very happy that at least someone understood what he was trying to express. And he said that I have the Dharma and Mahakasyaka understood me and may I entrust the Dharma to Mahakasyapa. So, from this story, um, so the Zen school or the Chan school started from here, and the Dharma was passed from the Buddha to Mahakasyapa, and all the way down to the 28th student, or the 28th patriarch of this lineage on the Indian Chan school to Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma is actually, you know, the Shaolin Temple, Putidamo, the Bodhidharma. So it was actually passed all the way in India till the 28th Patriarch Bodhidharma. And from Bodhidharma, he traveled to China, started the Chan School of China, and it all went down. And of course, finally to our Venerable Master Senyu, and finally to me. <laughs> so I think I could draw myself somewhere. <laughs> so this was the lineage. But What's more important was that we see a few things here. First, it was beyond words. It is not only telling us that, you know, I have something, can I share with you, whatever. It is about the mind, connecting between the mind and the mind, or the heart and the heart, or perhaps the brain and the brain. <coughs> just now when I was listening to Bill, I was just thinking, what's the difference between the heart, the brain and the mind? Is there any difference? I I'm not too sure perhaps we could discuss again, but what it's trying to say is that we are trying to connect beyond, beyond the obstacles of, beyond the obstacles of each path, of each passing down. For example, if I were to email you, you could get it almost immediately when I click send and you get it. It's fast. Because the connections or the, or the, what do you call that? The connections in between, it's, there isn't so much obstacles in between. But if I were to write you a letter and then put it into an envelope, go to the post office, wait for the postman, and this postman has to pass to the next postman before getting into your letterbox, and you open up the envelope and you read it. 
you still read my letter just as the email, the content is the same. But every part, it takes, you know, it's like it has to pass from one to two, two to three. It takes a much longer time and it may not be as original or as immediate as the email. So what Chan is saying is that it's just an email, it's immediate because it's without obstacle. So what is mindfulness in this Chinese context? It's actually, mindfulness is actually without obstacles. Obstacles could be in our own sensations, our own delusions, our own ignorance, or our own differentiation, whatever it is. When I differentiate, I'll think, oh, today Bill is talking, he is the professor in psychology, he is the president of NTI, then I have to prepare better this time. Or I would think that because there are more people this time around because of Bill, then I would have to do whatever. Because of this, I have to do that. Or while I'm sitting there, I'll to check. When he says, oh, venerable, is this the correct spelling? Can I say yes or no? I have to say yes because I don't know whether it's correct or not. <laughs> or I could say, no, what should, what would my response be? Could my mind or my heart or my brain be as clear as before? Or is it because I am somebody, therefore I have to behave in a certain way? Most of the time, we are like that. When I'm talking to you here, I have to behave in this way. When I was um, cleaning up the room, I have to behave in another way. When I'm standing beside the Abbess, I have to behave in another way, perhaps. So we have got many roles. We try to fit in our roles in the perception that we think it should be. What is Chan here? You just take it directly without all the perceptions. But of course, he had a lot of practice. He was actually the top disciple, the number one among all the disciples, as in his best learned. He practices um, his ethics, his precepts, he's all number one. So he, could able, he was able to connect directly because of all the practice. But what Chan or mindfulness is trying to tell us, perhaps from, especially from the humanistic Buddhism, the Fokongshan version, is that we could connect to the Buddha, we could connect to the Dharma, which is ourselves, directly. Because, okay, this story took place 2,600 years ago. There was this person called the Buddha. There was this person called Mahakasyapa. He plucked a flower, held it in his hand. He was able to smile. But what has it got to do with me? You know, I'm nowhere in this picture. This was just like 2,600 years ago. Could I be the person here? You know, I should be drawing my face not somewhere in here, but I should be here. Could you be sitting here as well? If only he was able to smile, and if in the course of history, in the whole of the universe, he is the only person who could smile, this story doesn't really make sense, to me at least. If I am able to smile here, then this story makes sense to me. Perhaps, maybe I'm more, um, I hope that I could be sitting here one day. So this position here is very important to me. So in the Chan school, what it's trying to tell us is that everyone can be the Buddha. Of course, there'll be like, you start with it as a student before becoming the teacher. You start with the disciple before becoming the master. But everyone could be the Buddha. As in, everyone has the ability to smile. So back to the, story, um, the, the part about mindfulness, is calmness, what does calmness mean? Because when we talk about mindfulness, most of the time we will say that, oh, I'm mindful, I'm not mindful, I try to be mindful, I wish I could be more mindful. Mindful seems to be a very positive word. You know, I'm, when I say that, oh, Liping is so mindful, I must be praising her, right? If I say that, you are not mindful, then yeah, yeah, that's good. But mindful, mindfulness is always a positive word to most of us. It means something positive. But does mindful means keeping quiet? Or does mindful means um, staying, staying still, being calm? If you are too calm, it's not very good. It's like, you know, if we are trying to be so calm that when someone talks here, we can't clap, we can't even smile, then it's no point being mindful. 
So from the eight noble, noble eightfold path, the word in front of mindfulness is actually right mindfulness. <laughs> right mindfulness. It doesn't mean I'm able to concentrate. It doesn't only mean that I know exactly what is happening at this point of time. It means with the right intention and the right path. So of course, we believe, if you are a Buddhist, we believe that the Buddhism is always the right path. So we are trying to follow this path of mindfulness. Then the next thing is that, how could I put my own face here? Of course, I could get an artist to just draw, you know, just draw my face <laughs> so it doesn't look like this, or I put myself somewhere. But how could I get myself a, a position here? Just like, how would you get yourself a seat in this room? How do we get this to this place? Can we have the next slide? This is very important, okay? This is the way to get ourselves a seat there. This is actually a very uh, common verse that all of us read. Uh, at least if you have had lunch with us, we read this before that, uh, before lunch. This is actually written by our Venerable Master Simun, who is also the founder of the Nantian Institute. So we see a lot of um, words that Bill um, used just now. Perhaps I could just explain this and show the connections of these four verses to Chan, you know, to just now that, that picture. And it helps us find a seat next to the Buddha. Okay. So may palms in every world be joined in kindness, compassion, joy and generosity. You know, when we try to tell ourselves that I want to be like the Buddha, or at least if I tell myself that I want to be calm, what is the greatest obstacle to us, an individual, of being calm? Why are we not calm? Or maybe I could ask Mitch, why are you always calm? Mm. Mm. What? Maybe less, um, less distracted or maybe more focused on the current, whatever it is I'm currently doing, or not jumping to conclusions. Um, not necessarily... Because um, I think, I, I definitely agree with the calmness does not correlate directly with mindfulness. Sometimes I'm thinking, you know, someone could be calm, but they're not necessarily very mindful. Um, but I think, yeah, in this case, it's more the calmness because of maybe not necessarily jumping to conclusions to try to absorb and process before reacting. So it's more of a chosen response as opposed to a reaction. Okay, a chosen response as opposite to a reaction. Yeah. Okay, what did you say? Will you accept? The, uh, Willing to accept, a, a willing and ability to accept. Anyone else? Being present. Hmm? Being present. Being present. Okay. What else? Don't want too much. Don't want too much. Don't want too much. Okay. Non-judgmental. Non-judgmental. Okay. <coughs> so we are non-judgmental. Therefore, we could be more calm. Willing to accept. Therefore, more calm. Or rather, a bigger heart. More space in our heart. If, if. This place is only about okay, two classrooms. It could accommodate about 50 people. What if 100 people turns up? The organizer, what if 100 people turns up? You'll be very, very happy. excited. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be very happy, very excited, because this is the first time in history that we have 100 people for a session like this. But the next thing is, how could I accommodate 100 people here? It's okay. So what you would do without the chairs, and you just sit on the floor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> all the way from all over, all over Australia. <laughs> yeah, you let them sit on the floor. <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say is that we need space in our hearts to be calm. We need a space. What is that space? Non-judgmental. We need um, at the present moment things like that. Is the space? The bigger is our heart the calmer we will be. Why? Because I don't have to react so fast. I won't be agitated. Most of the time we are agitated easily. What if 200 people just pop up? You can't make them sit to the fly this time. <laughs> so what do we do? Right. No, things like that. What if situations just arises and what if like 500 people comes? Which is possible. Perhaps the next time, if you were to get 10 people each, you have 500 people. Yeah. 
<laughs> so what happens when situations pop up? I can't manage. Can I be as calm? So, may palms in every world be joined in kindness, compassion, joy, and generosity. A kinder person, someone who is more kind, more compassionate, will be someone who is not so easily agitated. Because the element of hatred or the element of anger in ourselves is less. If you have more joy, there will be more. Uh, if there is more joy, there will be less anger, which means that I will be more calm. If someone is more easily, uh, more anger, less joy, I will be easily, more easily agitated. So we wish that in may palms in every wall, palms as in like this one to put palms together. So in the Buddhist um, practice, the gesture would be to put palms together to greet each other. But what this means is that um, in the Buddhist um, view, palms, putting two palms together means that I'm putting myself together, I'm putting my heart together, and it means that my, me as a person, I am together. So when I, pay, when I wish you um, all the best, or you have to show me with this gesture, it means that I'm greeting you with myself. I'm greeting you with kindness, compassion, joy, and generosity. Okay? May all beings find security in friendship, peace, and loving care. We, we would like to have friendship, we would like to have peace, we would like to have loving care. But we hope that all beings, as in like everybody, will be able to find security in all this. I say that I am feeling so calm but I'm not feeling secure. Is this ever possible? Yes? No, yes. How is it ever possible? I don't feel secure. How could I feel, how would I be calm when I don't feel secure? You know, are you sure you are sitting in a chair that can support you? Are you sure? <laughs> or are you sure this floor will be able to take us? Are you sure the ceiling will always be above your head? Look at it. You know, you are feeling not as calm anymore. <laughs> so we need to be secure. I need to have confidence that the chair can support me, the floor can support me, the ceiling will always be above me. I need to have security that within this box, I'm at least secure. With what? Friendship. This is between people. This is my friend, and that's my enemy. You know, it's difficult. If you are all my enemies, how could I feel a bit of joy in myself when I think that this person is going to find some trouble with me, this person we are going to fight, and that person is going to, you know, we have some problems. How could we have all these? How could we have peace and loving care? So we are trying to find a space for us to get to the Buddha and to understand this flower, this flower sermon. We need security. May calm and mindful practice give rise to deep patience and equanimity. So we have come to the keyword mindful practice. May calm and mindful practice. You know, in the Buddhist um, practice, there are a lot of meditation. You sit there, concentrate on your breath, and meditation begins. Or you see a lot of chanting, especially with the chanting beats. You know, quite a lot of them have chanting beats and you chant with the chanting beats. For every word that you chant, you move a beat, and then the next one, do it that way. Or we could have tea meditation. You meditate while drinking tea. We could have garden meditation. You meditate while cutting the trees, trimming the trees. All these things, what do they give us? They are actually only tool. Do I have to chant with the beats? No. Do I have to chant the Buddha's name? Not exactly. If I am the Buddha, I don't have to chant the Buddha's name. Perhaps I don't have to chant Buddha, 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 Amidaba, Amidaba, Amidaba. I could chant like uh, Li Ping, Li Ping, Li Ping, Li Ping. And she could not. Yeah, Baba wants that. You know, she could be faster than that Buddha. Perhaps. And the beats is just a tool to help us count. It is just a tool to help me stay focused. If I don't need the beats, if I don't use the beats, I'll be looking everywhere. How can I be calm and focused? If I don't sit in the meditation posture, 
how can I make sure that I don't move around? If I don't concentrate on my breath, how could I help myself be more focused? So all these are tools, you know, remember, they are tools to help us progress from the side nearer to the center, nearer to the Buddha. So it gives rise to deep patience and equanimity. All these practices help us have deep patience. I am a very patient person. I could wait for 10 minutes, but my patience stops at 10. At the 11th minute, oh, I can't. Please don't let me wait for more than 10 minutes. You know, we always have got this, our patience is, is actually very limited. Some people only have five, some people have 30, but you know, there's always a limit to my patience. I'll say, don't test my patience. But what is deep patience? Deep patience is actually a moment of calmness and clarity, okay? And understanding the conditions that arise. I may be agitated after 10 minutes because I know that she always, um, she's always late, for example. That's why I'm very agitated because I'm angry because how could you always be late? But if she has got something happening today or she didn't catch the train or whatever, I could, oh, these are the conditions. I would be more patient because I understand what's behind. So clarity or calmness, it's, it must work together with wisdom. Equanimity. Just now Bill was um, shared with us about equanimity, but equanimity is about calmness, non-attachment, and all others you could find on Google. But the Chinese translation of this word is actually shu. You know this, um, as in to give away? Shu, the Chinese word, is to give away. So letting go, letting go. Giving away or letting go. Why could, would equanimity be so important in this Buddhist context? If I were to say that, oh, today I donated $10 to a charity. Today I gave a loaf of bread to someone on the, on the streets. Today, I gave away something. It's just a practice of kindness, being able to give away. But what, when I'm able to give, it means that I'm less attached in another way. So where does our defilements or our troubles come from in the Buddhist context? We always talk about greed, hatred, hatred and ignorance, which is also attachment of ourselves. So just now when I started with a bigger heart allows us more space to be calm, it means that equanimity, being able to let go or to give away that little bit that we still can give away, it means that I'm actually stretching my heart. I'm stretching my heart. I'm allowing my heart to be filled with more elements. For example, if I could give a loaf of something to that person on the street, at least I will be connected to that person in a way. At least that, that living being will have a place in my heart. I'm not only living for myself. Then the last one, maybe give rise to spacious hearts and humble thoughts of gratitude. Spacious hearts. The bigger is our heart, the greater will be our lives. Not as in like, the greater will you raise on your professional development, but at least the happier will be ourselves. So, and humble thoughts of gratitude. Most of the time as we practice, I'll say that, oh, I'm such a calm person now. I'm so mindful. I'm more mindful than you. you know? When I try to compare, I'm more, um, more well-practiced than you. I'm something better than you. But on the other hand, when we try to practice mindfulness, it comes with gratitude and humbleness. What does being humble doesn't mean that um, I'm always less good than you, you know, you're here and I'm always here. Not exactly, because every living being is equal. Everyone has the Buddha nature, so we are all equal. So who is greater than the other person? You have a lecturer here, you have students here, you have a boss here and you have got the staff here, you know? In our place in life, there is always a different place, a different position, but as a living being, we actually equal. So being humble doesn't mean that I'm always bending down and I'm always below, no. It's just that I have you in my heart. I'm not looking, you know, upon, uh, looking, what do you call that? It's not upon, but looking yeah, down. Yeah. Yeah. Because the Dharma that is teaching all 
the thoughts of Buddhism, every living being is equal. Therefore, we are able to connect. Can I have that previous one? Okay, so back to this picture again. This is my favorite picture because I'm try I'm always trying to get my seat clear. <laughs> but what's more important is that when we talk about self-esteem or self-confidence, the Buddhist teachings, Buddhism believes that all living beings are equal. Why are we equal? Because all of us are bound with the Buddha nature. What is a Buddha nature? It's just the potential to become the Buddha. So in this way, what is the Buddha nature? It's just the potential to be able to smile. And if you were to look at all pictures of the Buddha, no matter whichever religion, uh, whichever tradition, whether in Tibet or in China or in the US or in Thailand, wherever you see, all the Buddhas, some of them are a bit um, plump, some of them are less plump, but it doesn't matter. But all of them has a very serene smile on their face. You don't see their teeth. You know, they're not smiling that widely smiling. But the very clear and serene and calm face. But obviously, there is some joy in that face. You know, no one, is, no one looks tired. No one looks sad. And no one looks angry. Every Buddha looks calm. And how do you know, how do we know that we ourselves have the Buddha nature? Of course, it's a theory of Buddhism that now everybody has a Buddha nature. But if you were to talk about the Buddha nature in a very, very simple context, perhaps it's just the ability to smile. Just imagine, if you are looking at this picture, and you can't even smile at this picture, as so like, you know, feel relaxed and smile a bit, then I think we have to dig somewhere out for our Buddha nature somewhere. Because it's just a... The Buddha nature is the heart. It's not the, the heart, you know, the organ, the heart. No, I can't, I can't show you my Buddha nature. I can't dig out my heart and this is my Buddha nature. It's not this way. But the, the ability to smile, the ability to feel warm, and the ability to share the joy and smile could be the Buddha nature in a very simple context. So learning Buddhism and learning mindfulness may not be telling us like, oh, you can sit still for like three hours, or you can talk about a lot of theories, or you could, um, you could do whatever, fill up all the questionnaires. And so I could draw myself here.